Good day, my name's uh, Hugh Reed, and I'm the CEO and founder of Reed Bar Review. Uh, Reed Bar Review offers law school tutoring, and it offers uh, uh, bar review courses, obviously, plus tutoring for those who need it to pass the bar exam. Uh, feel free to check out our website at readbarreview.com. But today, let's get right to the subject uh, at hand, which is hearsay. Hearsay. Uh, hearsay is probably the most important topic in evidence, and it's misunderstood. I mean, I meet 60-year-old attorneys in, um, in court who cannot ask a question without violating the hearsay rule. And uh, it's also one of the most confusing uh, uh, topics in evidence, but I'm going to give you some structure to hearsay today so that you can address a hearsay problem and get down the law, and hopefully you get the analysis correctly, all right? So it's, it, it's crucial to understand what constitutes hearsay and what constitutes the exceptions to hearsay. I call them exclusions and exceptions because the um, writers of the Federal Rules of Evidence actually build in some exclusions under Federal Rule 801D. Um, so let me give you the overview first, and then I'll get into some detail. Not too much, because whatever your professor decides is more important, or whatever the bar examiners decide to test on, is something that you should be familiar with. So hearsay, um, uh, under uh, 801, uh, says it's a statement other than one made by the declarant while testifying at trial or hearing, offered in evidence for the truth of the matter asserted. Now, this definition really doesn't help us a whole lot. The way I envision hearsay is that we have a witness on the stand, and he is testifying to something the declarant said out of court for the truth of the matter asserted. So um, the first thing uh, we have to identify is, do we have a witness on the stand who's testifying to something that a declarant said. And by the way, the declarant could be the person himself or herself. I told a police officer at the scene of the accident that the car went through the red light. That would be hearsay, because it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. But uh, another way of stating it is, uh, uh, or the attorney could ask, what color? was the light when the car went through the intersection. It was red. It would not be hearsay. So the prohibition of uh, the use of hearsay is, is probably the most single important rule in evidence, and that's why we want to talk about it. And the basic definition I've already told you. Uh, we have a witness on the stand who's testifying as to what the declarant, he's the person or she's the person, who made the statement out of court. And the gist of hearsay is that the trier of fact can only be asked to believe those statements made by witnesses at the trial, so we can cross-examine them, all right? In other words, um, we cannot be, uh, the fact finder cannot be presented with out-of-court statements and asked to believe that those statements were true. The first analysis of hearsay is always to decide whether or not these statements are being offered for the truth or are they being offered for some other reason, for some transactional reasons, or some words that have legal consequences. That's our first analysis, because uh, our first step to our analysis. The first thing we ask, uh, are those words being offered by the witness introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. If they're not being used for the truth of the matter asserted, then um, we, can, uh, we can perhaps um, introduce them into evidence. So for example, uh, statements or documents or assertions under hearsay can be um, used, uh, can be introduced for other purposes, such as verbal acts or words that have legal consequences, all right? So a, sta so a statement which gives rise to legal consequences, those statements are not hearsay. So words of defamation, 
words that have a contract, for example. The witness states, ah, uh, my friend, the declarant, uh, offered to buy the car for $500. That's an offer. Those words have legal consequences. They are not being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Or statements to show the effect on the hearer or the reader. So, for example, uh, the declarant said, his best friend is a backstabber. Well, the words obviously show the declarant's state of mind. They are not introduced to show that he's a backstabber. Right? Um, or words, uh, or conduct. Uh, the declarant nodded his head in agreement. Well, um, did, the, uh, did the declarant intend to say yes or no? All right? So some conduct is non-assertive, uh, is an assertion that is not hearsay. For example, uh, the declarant opened his umbrella. Well, why did he open his umbrella? If there's numerous interpretations, then he comes in for something other than the truth. Was it raining? Uh, was it uh, to show that it was raining? Was it to show that the sun was too hot? Was he shaking mud out of his umbrella? All right? So, um, so if he did not intend to say it was raining and he opened his umbrella, then there's no hearsay violation. Or, um, a sort of conduct offered for a different purpose other than the truth. So look for ways to get the uh, statement, uh, whether it's oral or written or whether it's an assertion in, without being offered for the truth. And of course, multiple hearsay, more often than not, it'll be tested in a police report. The police report is being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted where a witness said the car ran the red light. Well, we have two stages of hearsay here. We have the police report, which cannot be cross-examined, and we have a statement within the police report, which says the car ran the red light. Both are being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. Both statements, unless they can overcome some exclusion or exception to the hearsay rule, uh, are, uh, the whole thing is going to be thrown out as hearsay. All right, so that's where we are. Uh, so let's talk about, uh, let's talk about some exclusions and exceptions to hearsay. The first thing I ask uh, of you is to understand, is it being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, all right? So if it's being offered for falsity, or to show how a given witness merely reacted to a statement, it is not hearsay. And you should disregard all analysis of hearsay. A statement can be uh, nonverbal, can be assertive conduct, if it was intended by the declarant to be a statement, such as nodding of the head, as I indicated, yes or no, then it could be hearsay. Non-assertive conduct uh, is not hearsay, but merely uh, shows what the witness saw or heard. And a statement, as I said, could be written or oral. All right? Written or oral. Silence uh, in the absence of words or conduct may be taken as an assertion. So if a reasonable person would react to a statement, such as you and I sitting on a bar stool, neither one of us is a police officer, and you say, hey, Hugh, I know your mom died, and I know you did it. You killed her. I saw you buying a bunch of acid for the past six months. And coincidentally, that's what she died of. Now, a reasonable person would say, what the heck are you talking about? Right? I didn't kill her. But if I just keep sipping my beer, that could be an admission, an admission, if I'm tried for murder. So let's talk about um, some of the ex exclusions to hearsay under 801D. First of all, the analysis is, is it hearsay? Is it being offered for the truth of the matter asserted? Or can we get it in for some other purpose? 
And that seems to be the area that most people have problems with, and that I urge you, that's the area that you need to practice with. Secondly, if we decide it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted, then we say, is there an exclusion to hearsay? Some people call it exceptions. I call it an exclusion. Under 801D, Federal of Evidence 801D, we have several exclusions, and I remember them with CAPP, C-A-P-P-P. -P -P. If you want to write it down vertically, you can fill it out horizontally. CAPP. The C in CAPP stands for conspirators statement. A conspirator or co-conspirator statement made in furtherance and during the conspiracy. Those are admitted as an exclusion to hearsay. In other words, they're not hearsay. Co-conspirator statement. The A stands for an admission by party opponent. Who's a party opponent? Well, it's a plaintiff or a defendant in the case. Party opponent. Anything that was said by a plaintiff or a defendant comes in as an admission uh, to hearsay. Whether it's bad or whether it's good, it doesn't matter. It comes in as an admission. If it's bad, don't confuse it with a declaration against interest, which we'll talk about in a bit. Any statement reported by a witness by a party opponent comes in as an admission by party opponent. The first P in CAP stands for prior inconsistent statement under oath. Prior inconsistent statement under oath. So, if there was an adequate opportunity to cross-examine someone um, with regard to the issues at hand, and it was under oath, then that prior inconsistent statement under oath comes in as an exclusion, not only for impeachment purposes, but also for the substance of what was said. Prior inconsistent statement under oath. The second P is prior consistent statement. Prior consistent statement. A prior consistent statement now offered to refute a charge of recent fabrication comes in as an exclusion to hearsay. Prior consistent statement now offered to refute a charge of recent fabrication comes in. So for example, um, it's at the scene of an accident. A a uh, bystander turns to another bystander and says, that car just went through the red light. Now the police shows up. He tells the car went through the green light or had the green light. And now at trial, he's reverting back to his original testimony that the car went through the red light. Well, um, that comes in as an exclusion to hearsay because, um, you know, he can say, I was confused when the police officer showed up. I thought he was talking about the other car. So prior consistent statement, he can show that he made a prior consistent statement that the car went through the red light. And then finally, the uh, third P is prior ID of a person, prior identification of a person. So prior identification of a person Obviously, the person who made the ID has to be in court to be cross-examined, but that's an exclusion to hearsay. The prior ID is generally made from a lineup or for some sort of uh, a book that the police has with mugshots, prior identification of purpose. So first, let's review. Is it hearsay? Is the statement by the witness of what the declarant said made for the truth of the matter asserted? Uh, if it's not, if it's words of legal consequences or words that show the effect on the hearer or listener or for some other reason, it's never hearsay. But if it is being offered for the truth, then we ask ourselves, well, did the writers of the Federal Rules of Evidence in 1978, did they intend to exclude certain um, statements uh, as non-hearsay? 
under 801D, Federal Rule 801D, CAPP, C-A-P-P-P. -P -P. All right. Well, if they didn't, if we still can get it in, then we have to go to some exceptions. And I urge you to go to the exceptions under Federal 804 first, Federal 804, because there the declarant has to be unavailable. He's unavailable. How do you tell if a declarant is unavailable? I want you to write down PRISM vertically, P-R-I-S-M. A declarant is unavailable if he takes a privilege, the P. The R stands for refusal to testify. The I stands for incapacity. The S stands for subpoena powers, generally a federal court. There are some exceptions, obviously. Uh, only has subpoena powers within the bulge rule, the 100 miles of the courthouse. The M stands for memory problems. Old people, young people, memory problems. So how do you tell if a person is incapacitated uh, or if it's unavailable, I'm sorry, prison, P-R-I-S-M. And if he's unavailable, or she's unavailable, then we go to, uh, to Federal Rule 804, where declarant has to be unavailable in order to get it in as an exception to hearsay. I remember those instances with SFPDW, SFPDW, or if it helps, San Francisco Police Department wagon. If you can imagine a police wagon that says SFPD on it, um, and our illustrator has imagined that, <laughs> it's in our handout, then you can run through the exceptions where the declarant has to be unavailable, unavailable under 804. The S stands for statements against interest. Statements against interest. A statement against proprietary, penal, or pecuniary interest. Um, we can get it in if the declarant is unavailable, if he meets one of the elements of prison. And a statement against interest, uh, the most often tested concept, is a criminal case. Let's say a defendant's on trial for murder. He gets his good friend, next door neighbor, Fred, to testify that defendant didn't do it, Bubba did it. Unfortunately, Bubba is unavailable. Well, are we gonna allow Fred to testify that Bubba said he did it instead of the defendant? And the answer is no. For criminal cases, there has to be corroborating evidence, other evidence, to show that Bubba actually made this statement, all right? Statement against interest. The uh, F in SFPDW stands for former testimony. If there was former testimony under oath, depositions, trial, whatever, discussing the issues at hand, and there was an opportunity for cross-examination, then we can get that testimony in, even though the declarant's unavailable. In fact, he has to be unavailable for SF, uh, for um, uh, 804. So SFP, the P stands for pedigree, pedigree, or a statement as to family history. Even though the declarant is unavailable, we can get a statement as to his family history into evidence at the current trial, because the idea is people generally do not lie about their family history. Right? Declarant said he was the Duke of Earl. Well, we can get it in if the issue is whether or not he was the Duke of Earl even though he's unavailable. D stands for dying declaration. Lots of action on the bar exam and on essays for dying declaration. Declarant's unavailable. How do you know he's unavailable? Well, we said prism, prism. But what are the elements of a dying declaration? I remember those with Cuba, C-U-A, uh, strike that, C-U-B-A, C-U-B-A. 
a statement as to see the cause of death. You, declarants unavailable, unavailable, we know that, we're in 804. The B, a statement, a belief, belief in why he's dying. And finally, A, admissible in all civil cases, but only in homicide on the criminal side. So, Cuba, a statement as to the cause of death. The guy shot me in the back, I'm dying. All right? He's unavailable. Now, he didn't have to die. He could be on the beach in Florida, but he's unavailable for some of the reasons in prison. He could be on a beach in Florida. He's got to believe he's dying. The guy shot me. I know I'm dying. Not I think I'm dying. I know I'm dying. Even though he didn't die. And then that's admissible in all civil cases, but only in criminal cases uh, for homicide. Cuba, dying declaration. And finally, SFPDW. W. w stands for wrongful withholding of testimony. So if those of you who saw, uh, I don't know, Breaking Bad, for example, Heisenberg tells Jesse, if you show up at my trial, you're a dead man. Jesse shows up, but he refuses to testify. He uh, claims some religious privilege or something. Well, can we get the investigators or the police officers who talk to Jesse to talk about what Jesse would testify to? The answer is yes. Or Al Capone tells his accountant on his tax evasion trial, hey, I know where you live and your family's dead if you show up. The accountant's not going to testify. Can we get the investigators or the police officers to testify what uh, the accountant would say? The answer is yes. Under 804, wrongful withholding of testimony, uh, once we show there's some evidence of wrongful withholding of testimony, others can testify what the uh, witness would have testified to. So SFPDW, all right? SFPDW. That's very important. Um, now, is it hearsay? Well, is it being offered for the truth, or can we get it in for something else? Um, if, it is, if it is hearsay, does it meet one of the exclusions to hearsay, CAP, C-A-P-P-P? and we still can't get it in, then we decide, well, can we get it in under an exception to hearsay where the declarant is unavailable? We know he's unavailable if we go through PRISM, P-R-I-S-M. And then we check the exceptions to unavailability, 804, Federal Rule 804, um, SFPDW. All right, we still can't get it in. Uh, now, we really, really have to uh, go to the exceptions under 803. There's 23 exceptions, last count. Luckily for us, they test the first few first, or a lot, and the others not so much. So 803 says, these are exceptions to hearsay where the declarant's av availability is immaterial. It can be available or not. And I remember them, uh, at least the most often tested uh, uh, exceptions, with PETS, P-E-T-S. Again, write it down vertically. PETS, RAP, R-R-A-P, at, A-T, the farm, F-A-R-M. PETS, RAP, at, the farm. All right, so let's go through those and uh, try to make some sense of those. Pets wrap at the farm. 8031, present sense impression. Present sense impression. The idea is that anything uh, 
a witness or the declarant says, where he has no time to fabricate, could be a present sense impression. You and I are walking along. I'm suing the city for not fixing the sidewalk. And I say to you as I trip on the sidewalk, damn it, or darn it, I wish they'd fix this sidewalk. It's been, you know, uneven for, for months, if not years. Can you testify as to what I said? Yes, present sense impression, because there was no time to fabricate present sense impression. The E in pets stands for excited utterance. Look for exclamation marks. Right? I saw Bubba, and he said, look out. Uh, you know, the train is coming off the tracks. That's an excited utterance. Or, uh, you know, I mean, you can think of numerous examples. Look for uh, a person said it, you know, with an exclamation mark, even excitedly on the bar exam. That could come in as an excited utterance. The T in pets stands for then existing mental, physical, or emotional, emotional condition. Then existing. So it's always a then existing condition. It could be forward-looking, according to the famous Hillman case. I'm going to Crooked Creek next week. Well, that would be a then existing mental condition. It's never backward-looking, with one exception, and that's with regard to the validity of wills. wills. My uncle told me he was going to leave me the 57 Chevy. All right. Um, that's obviously hearsay, what the uncle told him. It could come in what his uncle's intent was with regard to the validity of a will. All right. If there is, you know, if there's some sort of uh, debate as to whether the 57 Chevy was really being left to the nephew, then existing mental, physical, and emotional conditions. S stands for statements made for purposes of medical diagnosis. And these are very liberally construed. I get run over by a truck, I go out and hire a, a doctor. Well, I hire a lawyer first, obviously. <laughs> but I hire a doctor second, and I say, hey, you know, my leg hurts like hell, and my back is all screwed up, I want you to come testify as to what I told you. He can come and testify as to what I told him. It's very liberally construed. Statements made for purpose of medical diagnosis. diagnosis. And then RAP, R-R-A-P. If you think of rappers, uh, you know, no offense to rappers, but probably some of them would misspell rap. And, I, and if you spell it R-R-A-P, then you can remember some of the exceptions to hearsay where the declarance availability is immaterial. The first R stands for recorded recollection under 803.5. This is often confused with refreshing recollection, which is um, an, uh, an issue that's discussed or tested in uh, presentment of testimony. So refreshing a recollection is the idea that we can show anything to a witness who may have forgotten something and refresh his or her recollection. Um, and it could be anything. And then he testifies from his own memory. Whereas uh, recorded recollection is something a witness wrote years ago or months ago or adopted years or months ago and now he can't remember. Could be an insurance claim. What was stolen from your apartment in 1907? Heck, I don't know. I can't remember. Well, uh, here's the insurance claim. Um, does that refresh your recollection? Not really. I mean, I wrote down so many things, I can't remember what's on the insurance claim. Would the court allow the witness to read the insurance claim into the record? Ah, yes. Uh, 
you know, this was stolen, that was stolen, this was stolen. And it's not allowed into evidence as an exhibit unless the other side uh, wants to allow it as an exhibit. But the idea is the way you distinguish between refreshing recollection and past recollection recorded is that refreshing recollection, something is shown to the witness, he or she testifies from his own memory. Past recollection recorded, he reads everything into the record, something that he had uh, wrote or adopted as true shortly after it occurred. The second R in pets rap is regularly conducted activity. And these are most often business records, regularly conducted activity. So the slip and fall record of the McDonald's manager um, taking statements from someone who fell in the lobby because of the wet um, floor, that's not a regularly conducted activity because uh, it doesn't meet uh, the smell test or the truth test. I mean, the McDonald's manager is going to state everything in that, uh, in that report that's favorable to McDonald's. But when he ordered buns, when he ordered hamburgers, when he ordered fries, uh, uh, that is a regularly conducted activity and he doesn't have to testify to that. It could be a, a record that's introduced as an exhibit so long as we have someone who's in the courtroom who can testify as to, yeah, that's how McDonald's does business. It doesn't have to be the person who actually wrote the report. Regularly conducted activity. Um, police reports, by the way, for criminal cases are not regularly conducted business records. So that's tested often. In a civil case, maybe. In a criminal case, never. And then the A in RAP is absence of records. You know, if you, where, where, where are the records? You ordering buns? Oh, I didn't keep them for two weeks. That's strange. Now we can introduce that, that perhaps there was something wrong with the buns because there was an absence of records. The P in RAP stands for public records and reports. Um, airplane accident. The FAA does an investigation, it writes a report. It sends it over to the Justice Department for prosecution. Um, do, they have any, uh, do they have any need to falsify the report? No. In fact, their job is to make it as truthful as possible. Therefore, it's an exception to hearsay, all right? Public records. The at is out of sequence a bit for the federal rules of evidence of what I'm telling you. 801, 802, 80, uh, I'm sorry, 8031, 8032, 8034, so forth. The at, often tested, is out of sequence. Uh, the A stands for ancient documents on the 80316, ancient documents. For the federal rules, it's 20 years or more. And the T stands for treatises, learned treatises under 803.18. Learned treatises, tested often as an exception to hearsay. Also, it's introduced as impeachment and for the substance of what's in that learned treatise, 803.18. And then get, getting back to the others, farm, F-A-R-M, family records, 803.9, absence of records, 803.10, religious organizations, 803.11, marriage, baptismal certificates, 803.12. Um, one other they might test you on uh, is uh, felony convictions, 803.22, I believe it is. If you've been convicted of a felony and there's a subsequent civil case, remember in a felony case, we have to prove things beyond a reasonable doubt. Civil case, preponderance of the evidence, or at most, clear and convincing evidence, then we can introduce, uh, we don't have to go through the proof again that you did this, all right? So we can prove up under 803.22 that you were found guilty in a criminal 
case. All right, let me summarize. Is it hearsay? Hearsay can be, is a statement um, that was made out of court by the declarant, now offered in court, for the truth of the matter asserted. There are certain uh, statements that are not hearsay. The most often tested are uh, the uh, uh, verbal acts, words that have legal consequences, words that show the effect on the hearer or the reader, uh, declaring state of mind. All right? I stab my, my, my best friend is a backstabber. Uh, Non-assertive conduct, assertions or assertive conduct offered for a different purpose. And then remember that if the statement has multiple, multiple uh, hearsay issues, each level of hearsay has to be covered by some exclusion or hearsay. If not, the whole statement is inadmissible. Finally, uh, or next, we decide whether or not the statement uh, meets an exclusion to hearsay under 801D. And I remember them with CAPP, C-A-P-P-P. -P -P. If we still can't get the statement in, is the declarant unavailable? We ask ourselves, is he unavailable under PRISM, P-R-I-S-M? If he's unavailable, we go to Federal 804, S-F-P-D-W. SFPDW. If we still can't get the statement in, go to 803 and its many exceptions, where the clearance availability is immaterial. And I remember them with pets wrap at the farm. That should give you uh, some sort of um, checklist or step-by-step -step approach as to handle any hearsay issue. And if you need more training in this area, please go to our website and uh, uh, pick out a free course in evidence and get the lecture, the, the, uh, uh, the flashcards, and anything you need to get you ready for the evidence part of the exam. Thank you so much, and uh, if you need any help, call us 800-852-EXAM. Thank you.